actually see it directly, a bag of powerful muscle expanding and contracting as it takes blood in from the veins and pumps it out into the arteries. This is a model of the human heart. Inside it's pretty complicated. It's divided into four separate compartments and it's really two pumps combined into one. Blood for the whole of the body except the lungs leaves the heart from the left ventricle, this big chamber, and it passes out into the body's main artery, the aorta, and from that motorway into other main roads or arteries. The branching arteries carry the blood to different parts of the body. The blood flows through the arteries under considerable pressure as the heart pump drives it out in powerful surges. Margaret is having her blood pressure taken. A hollow rubber tube is wrapped tightly around her arm, then pumps up with air so that it squeezes even more tightly and eventually stops the flow of blood down the main artery of her arm. Then the air pressure is gradually released again. At a certain air pressure, the blood pressure in her artery will be just enough to force blood down past the rubber tube and the doctor can then hear it throbbing through his stethoscope. It's just come through at a pressure of 100 millimeters of mercury. So that's Margaret's blood pressure. We all have to have a blood pressure. It's only when it's irregular or very high or low that it means there might be something wrong with us. The arteries are connected by networks of very fine blood vessels called capillaries to the veins. These capillaries are the side streets where all the loading and unloading goes on and there are capillaries in every part of our bodies where there are living cells. From the capillaries, the blood passes along the veins until it reaches the heart again. It enters the right atrium, a smaller chamber, from where it passes through a valve into the right ventricle. The first valve shuts behind it, then it squirts out through another valve into the pulmonary artery, which takes the blood to the lungs. In the lungs, as we saw in the last program, the blood gives out carbon dioxide and takes in fresh oxygen. Its red corpuscles turn from purply red to bright red. This happens in the tiny capillaries wrapped round the alveoli, more side streets where unloading and loading can take place. This oxygen-rich blood now passes into the left atrium of the heart, through a valve into the left ventricle again, and out to the body once more. It's possible to see the blood circulation in action in part of the body where the blood vessels are near the surface. If you look into someone's eye with an instrument called an ophthalmoscope, you can see quite clearly the retina at the back of the eyeball. This has a rich blood circulation with arteries, capillaries and veins serving the nerve cells which enable us to see. But the capillaries are too fine to show up and you can't see the blood actually moving. So here's a photograph taken a few seconds after a special dye has been injected into an artery in the neck. This dye fluoresces, that is, it appears very bright when a light shone on it. See the light-coloured tubes spreading in from the top left where the arteries enter? This shows that the blood carrying the dye has just arrived at the retina. Now, a fraction of a second later, the whole retina is lit up as the dye passes into the network of tiny, almost invisible capillaries. Next moment, the blood with the dye has passed into the veins. The arteries and capillaries have faded, the dye has passed through them. The veins have lit up as the blood drains away through them out of the retina. Now let's look at that on film as it actually happens. The fluorescent dye has just been injected. In a few seconds it will reach the retina. Watch. There. See how fast the blood carrying the dye flashed along the arteries through the capillaries to the veins and out again? Watch it again. There. 
you can see how quickly the blood races round the transport network. Here it is for the last time. Let's find out more about the blood which races round our bodies. We can take a sample from a vein. An artery will be too dangerous because of the pressure of blood inside it, and we can do an experiment with it. We put it in a test tube with a special chemical substance to stop it from clotting. We'll investigate blood clotting in a later program. Then into a centrifuge, which will spin the blood round at high speed. you can see that the blood separated into two layers. The solid matter at the bottom contains the red blood corpuscles which carry oxygen from the lungs to the rest of the body, and also other particles which we'll meet in a later program. The yellow liquid above is the blood plasma, and the blood carries away many of its important cargoes other than oxygen round the body dissolved in this liquid. The cargoes the blood carries are very like the ones we see on the road. There's got to be fuel to provide the body with energy and building material so that the body can grow and repair itself. And waste material, rubbish. The fuel and building material comes from the food we eat. This is digested in the stomach and intestines, then carried by the blood from the intestines to the liver. Here's our model of the small intestines. And this is what part of the blood circulation system looks like, which carries chemical substances from the intestines to the liver. In the liver, the substances from our food are turned into exactly the right fuel and building material for the body and carried off by the blood to where they're needed. Imagine this is one tiny capillary side street supplying living cells somewhere in the body. Fuel and building material brought along dissolved in the blood plasma pass through into the cells. Oxygen is unloaded from the red corpuscles. This is used in the cells to burn the fuel and produce the energy they need. This produces carbon dioxide, which passes into the blood plasma, dissolves, and will be carried back to the lungs and breathed out. But living cells produce other unwanted waste products as well, and these pass out into the capillaries to dissolve in the plasma. How are these got rid of by the body? The carbon dioxide is got rid of through the lungs. Other waste products are got rid of through the kidneys. Here's our scale model again, but with the intestines and liver removed. There are two kidneys. If we look inside one, we can get a simple idea of how it works. They're really filter beds. Blood, carrying those waste products, passes through a mass of tiny filtration units which remove the waste, and the purified blood then goes on round the body. The waste materials dissolved in water come out in the centre of the kidney as urine. This passes along a pipe called a ureter down into a storage organ, the bladder. This is a strong muscular bag which can stretch to hold a lot of urine coming down from the two kidneys. Until it is passed out through here when we urinate. 
At some stage in its circulation round the body, all blood passes through the kidneys for purification. Contrast these tiny purifiers with a man-made artificial kidney. Machines like this do a wonderful job keeping people alive whose kidneys have failed for some reason or another. But even the most modern kidney machine is a pretty clumsy device compared with the two organs, each about the size of a fist, which purify our blood as it circulates endlessly round our bodies, carrying fuel and oxygen and building materials, as well as many other essential cargoes to every part of the living body. Our brains, the organs which make us special animals, depend upon their life-giving supply of blood. So does every other part of the body. The bloodstream is the stream of life. 